Um, thank you for joining us. Ellie Krieger, cookbook author extraordinaire, joins us this evening to celebrate her new cookbook, Hole in One. But before I continue, I would just like to remind you that all of our programs are made possible by the Friends Annual Campaign and through your generous donations and continued support. Thank you very much. And if you will please silence your cell phones and refrain from texting. Ellie's cookbook is one that you will want to keep because you will refer to it often. There are 125 one pot, one skillet, one pan recipes that are all healthy, easy, nutritious, and minimize the work on both ends, the preparing and the cleaning up. Ellie received a degree in clinical nutrition from Cornell and a master's degree in nutrition from Columbia. She is the winner of uh, James Beard Foundation, I guess, award twice, and a New York Times bestselling author t t two times. She has published or written, I guess I should say, seven, did you tell me? This is my seventh. This is her seventh like cookbook. Seven. <laughs> okay, and she was on the forefront of Michelle Obama's Healthy Kids Fair held on the White House, White House lawn. In addition, if you can believe it, <laughs> Ellie is host and executive producer of the public TV shows Ellie's Real Good Food and a host of the Food Network's hit show Healthy Appetite. With her unique and creative title, Hole in One, this book is a perfect gift for you and your golfing friends <laughs> who have never made a hole in one until now. So um, after Ellie's talk, you may purchase a copy of her book from Barrett's Bookstore, Darian's own independent bookstore right in the heart of town. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Ellie Krieger to Darian Library. So thank you so much. It is really wonderful to be here. And thanks to Barrett Books, not only for bringing the books, but also for baking. I mean, who <laughs> bakes for you? That is a beautiful thing. So I really appreciate that. I'm sure you would do, too, to get to try some of the desserts in the book. Um, and thank you for coming out tonight and being here. It's really nice to meet you and be part of a library. I mean, I love, I'm, I'm just a library fan and this type of community. <laughs> Um, that shows up for the library. I'm, I'm a fan of that too, so I really appreciate that. I'm happy to be a part of it. So I guess I just wanted to talk for a few minutes and let you get to know me a little, um, tell you about um, why I do what I do and what motivates me and my passion for this wonderful food, and then kind of a little bit about the book. So, um, so my mother, she has a lot of my mother. You know, moms know their kids. Being a mother of a 17-year-old, you realize how deeply you know this person, and also how you don't in a way, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but uh, my mother says that me becoming a nutritionist is like a pyromaniac becoming a firefighter. <laughs> so if there's really one thing that just sums me up, that's pretty much it. Um, and, and I love food from the minute I was born, for as long as I could remember, it always fascinated me. I was always kind of gravitating toward, toward the kitchen. I was always, I loved going to food. I grew up in Queens, and I loved going to, we'd go to the Greek church food festivals, and I'd be there. My first Spanakopita, I totally remember that moment. Um, it was like, oh, the best thing I ever had. And... Um, and I just, also, my parents loved to like take us to restaurants from different cultures, and I just uh, had a lot of opportunities to do that and really relished it. Um, but maybe relished it a little bit too much. I mean, I really was out of balance in my life. I was, I think maybe it was one of the only things that I really felt connected to was food. And I wasn't very active. I didn't feel good about myself. My, I didn't feel like I could catch a ball or play frisbee or do, I wasn't very active, so I spent a lot of time eating. <laughs> and you know, what happens? So I was kind of overweight as a child, and I wouldn't say very overweight, but I had a terrible self-image, and it was really, I definitely overate regularly. And then as I got into my teens, I actually went in the other direction, and 
started losing weight and dieting and getting into this whole world of dieting and becoming very overly restrictive and almost like obsessive about food in a negative, uh, compulsive way. And I went on and um, that's sort of my trajectory because I have this real happy ending is that I eventually learned how to love food in a healthy way. And it took me many years to do that. A lot of that was studying nutrition and learning about nutrition and what my body needs and learning about how to nourish myself, truly nourish myself. And part of nourishing myself is eating the foods that fuel my body. Part of the nourishing myself is eating the foods that I just genuinely, sensually want. And part of nourishing myself is knowing when to stop and being active and living an active life and having that balance. So, you know, I've been doing that for many years now, so I really, most of the struggle was more in my teens, my childhood and my teens, but I think that always really, really shaped my, my, my food philosophy. And so that is reflected in all of my food. <laughs> there's a big passion for food there, but there's a real sense of balance. Um, and I think, I don't know how to work this, there. So this is a quote from one of my first books. I think my first cookbook, I put this in the introduction. Um, and I, I find that a lot of people uh, put this out on Instagram and kind of quote me on it, which I was like, wow, a lot of people like tag me as they're, they're posting this quote. And I realized that it struck, a, struck a, a nerve. And it really is the essence of, I think, what my overall food philosophy is. Um, I think we live in a world now where when we talk about healthy eating, all of a sudden you almost want to, um, you know, you get like short of breath with panic, like what, everything seems bad and there's a lot of fear and then you're supposed to be cutting out this and stopping eating that and, and be all in these extremes. And I think it sets you up for failure. It sets you up for an emotional roller coaster. It, it's this whole diet culture that we live in, even if the word diet isn't cool anymore. Now it has a different framework, you know, now it's, it's called something else. It's not called a diet, it's called like wellness or I don't know what, a lifestyle, but it's still a diet because it's making you not eat all these things that you really want that can nourish you. So um, anyway, in my food world, there is no fear, there is no guilt because there's, what, it doesn't help. Um, there's joy and balance. So that's really my framework for everything. And, and to get there, I think um, I want to explain to you a little more specifically how I get to this place of joy and balance because um, we say, oh, everyone says, oh, everything in moderation, right? But like, what does that mean anyway, right? So I do have a sense, I do have some direction there about what that does mean. But getting to that point, I think we live in a, in a culture, in a world where we're meant to see, and if you really look around, you start to realize that it's everywhere, that we're meant to see that delicious food is over here, and here's the food that you really want. This is the stuff that you crave that looks ooey and gooey and that you're watching on TV being made and that you, that you really want. But for some, somehow it's not good for you. You're really not supposed to have it. You're supposed to feel bad about it. And then over here is this healthy food. This is the food you should be eating because it's perfect and you want to be perfect, right? And this is the food that, um, you know, that gives you everything you need but that you don't really... It's almost like you're afraid to like food too much because you're not supposed to like this food that much. <laughs> Otherwise, you might want too much. Um, and so, and that's what healthy sort of is now, this, air, this way of deprivation, of perfection, um, and all of these things that are imposed upon us. And these are ideas that are imposed upon us. These are not true. And I'm going to tell you what I believe and which I know to be the truth. This. That's what I call the sweet spot that there is this beautiful place where healthy and delicious live together. And if you can live in there, um, then there's no guilt. There's joy and balance. And you're eating the food that you really want. And you're doing it in a healthy way. Um, and there's this incredible intersection. And that's what I'm always exploring. That's, where I'm, that's what my goal always is. And sometimes I'm going to be in one extreme or another. I mean, but I'm talking about balance over a little bit wider vision. Not that every meal is perfectly in balance like that, but a wider vision like maybe my week or my month is going to be. Um, so I think that a lot of the diets and things that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis have this very narrow vision of this perfect meal, of this perfect day, of this perfect... But um, we can have a little wider vision. 
Um, and so I see food as usually, sometimes, and rarely. And that's what I mean by moderation. So I think, um, and I define it further in my, um, my first book that I wrote is called Small Changes, Big Results. And it's, it's not, it has a lot of recipes, so it's kind of a cookbook, but it's also really more of a 12-week plan. And I lay out exact what the usually, sometimes, rarely like food lists are. But it's not a really even that critical to, it's more the concept that I think is really helpful. So if you make the usually foods the backbone of your diet, what you eat the most, most often, those are the most common choices, then you're going to be on a good track. Um, so the usually foods, vegetables, whole fruits, um, nuts, seeds, beans, healthy oils, um, low f dairy like yogurt, um, the low fat thing is like less important, um, lean proteins, fish, so you get the idea, right? Whole foods, um, and then sometimes foods, um, whole grains, speaking of that, and then sometimes foods are, maybe they're a little bit more processed. So like white bread, like a baguette. You think I'm living my life without a baguette once in a while? It's not going to happen. Um, but, uh, or maybe some sweeteners like honey or maple, maple syrup, um, less refined sweeteners. And so these are things you could sprinkle in daily in, but just that you might want to just kind of watch the portion or have once in a while, or but sprinkle in sometimes for, for, um, for texture. So for example, like if I'm making a cake, well actually I love whole wheat pastry flour and the cake that they, these guys made in the sheet pan, um, that's made with all whole wheat pastry flour, but sometimes just a little bit of regular flour is what you need in that recipe to bring it from like delicious, from like good to delicious, and I vote for delicious with a little bit of white flour. So, um, but I mostly use whole grains. Um, so that's the usually. And then the rarely foods are basically all those foods that like a lot of chefs use with a heavy hand, like butter, bacon, cream, um, sugar. But that, uh, but that, and a lot of dietitians, nutritionists, they kind of say no to, but I, I believe that there should be no such thing as never because for me, if you tell me that I can't have a piece of chocolate cake, all of a sudden chocolate cake becomes very important to me. <laughs> when I kind of, I could take it or leave it normally, like it doesn't, it doesn't take up too much space in my head, but suddenly if you tell me I can't have it, then suddenly I think about it all the time. Um, so you take away that element of the forbidden fruit. And you can have it if you really, if it's a really good one, and you're gonna have whatever whatever factors lead to that decision for you. That's personal. That might be depending on the moment. But knowing that you can, I think, is a huge, powerful thing. Um, but anyway, the notion of rarely, of where does it fit in? So if you had a piece of chocolate cake this afternoon, maybe you don't want another one tonight. And just like making those kinds of decisions for yourself. Um, so the notion of rarely. Um, so I use bacon. If I'm going to make a BLT, for example, I'm gonna, I use this example sometimes. This isn't in the whole in one book. But if I'm going to make just a BLT, I'll, um, I'm going to use real bacon because I don't want fake bacon in my BLT. <laughs> Um, it's the first letter of the thing, B. <laughs> um, but I'm going to use a really nice fat local tomato, vine ripe tomato. I'm going to use whole grain bread, um, maybe even one with nice seeds in it or some kind of you know texture to it. And instead of mayo, I'll take some avocado and herbs and kind of make a spread like that. So now it's a mostly a usually thing: whole grains, vegetables, avocado, healthy fat. And so there's some rarely, I'll put a couple of pieces of bacon. I'm not going to put like seven pieces of bacon. <laughs> but so that's the idea of how it works and how you can have what you want, but have it in a healthier way um, and just see this again uh, in a less extreme sort of way. So, so that's the framework. And I actually, I, was, I used to be in private practice as a dietitian. And I developed this list because my clients would come to me and I, uh, and tell me they want to be on a diet, and then eventually I'd get them to this place of like, what is moderation um, in, in your life? And um, and this list, these lists were really helpful. And it, what it, I didn't expect to happen is that it wound up framing everything that I do. So every recipe that I make, I think about this. How can I make it a usually thing? Where does it need some texture? Does it need you know maybe some sweetener to round out the flavor? 
um, because especially with certain like maybe Asian seasonings, you know, it just doesn't taste right if it doesn't have some, how can I use a less refined sweetener and a minimal amount? Maybe I'll put some fresh fruit in there. Maybe I put figs in there and that'll bring sweetness to it in a more usually way. So I always think it really frames how I create these recipes. And I provide the nutrition data for all my recipes, but I don't start off thinking like, oh, I'm going to achieve these numbers. Although I do have some benchmarks that I, that I have, um, if it's you know over this amount of sodium, I'll take a look at it. But um, but I don't cook to the numbers. I cook it in the kitchen to uh, with these lists in mind, and I cook to taste and for it to taste great and look great, and I want to want it. And what's amazing is when I cook according to this framework, the numbers work out in the end, ninety nine percent of the time. And so I think it's really cool that you don't have to worry about the numbers really. I put them there as a guide in case you know you are looking at that and it's sometimes helpful to see those numbers as a guide. But for the most part, if you're just eating in this way, it works out anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but I find that kind of magical. Oh, so hole in one. Um, so I want to tell you, this is one of my favorite recipes from hole in one. So I want to tell you about why I kind of came up with this concept. So besides, you know, really wanting to bring incredibly flavorful food that's also good for you, um, and, I, and I lead with flavor, uh, besides that, it has to be easy. <laughs> because I'm like, I don't have to, I, I write these books, I think, for myself half the time. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, because um, I, I have a 17-year-old daughter. I love my family dinners, you know, as many, it doesn't happen every night, but as many nights as we can. And I come home and cook after working all day. And, um, and I, I want, I found that life can be so chaotic that this notion of distilling everything into one vessel with one thing to clean up. And my husband always does the dishes, so really, this is like a gift to him, honestly. <laughs> like, he, um, so, uh, Typically, but just to not have a big mess, to just be able to just do this. And I try to really minimize the amount of bowls and stuff, too, um, that you can do this. And it just feels contained, and it feels really doable, but still really inspired and flavorful and healthy, and everyone's going to love. So it's a tall order. And I really did spend a lot of time, sort of a lot of sleepless nights, waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I could do this. Um, so I spend a lot of time and put a lot of love in it, into it. So this is why it's a really fun part to me, too, to be able to share it with everyone. Because it takes about two years from the thought of the idea of the recipe of the book to the putting out the book. So it's a pretty amazing process. So um, what else do I want to tell you about Hole in One? And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions also. I guess I'll run through and, and then uh, we can talk more about that. We, I'll take some questions. But this recipe uh, demonstrates uh, a particular aspect of it. So everything's made either, oh, this is what I want to tell you. Everything's made either in a pot, sheet pan, or skillet. So I, I feel like somehow everyone's buying these big electric devices that take up their whole counter space. And that's cool, like if you like that, but you don't need that to do a one pot meal. And I don't know how somehow we got our, our heads wrapped around this notion that we need some kind of fancy gadget in order to make a one pot meal. Well, you can make a better one in a, pan, in a regular pan skillet or, um, or sheet pan, uh, uh, pot, sheet pan, or skillet. So just with the equipment you have right now. So I kind of wanted to drive that home too. Um, but anyway, so this soup is um, the, uh, it's a butternut squash soup with tahini and crispy chickpeas. So it's, and the way I make it a meal, so that was one thing of like, okay, I love butternut squash soup. How do I make this a meal? I take a can of chickpeas and put it in and simmer that with the onion and butternut squash and then puree that together. So you're getting your protein from a whole, all those beans. So there's a lot of vegetarian, re vegetarian recipes in the book and all of them, so the whole whole in one refers to that it's whole foods and so on, but also that it's a complete meal. So from a nutritional point of view, this could be, di this is dinner. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to make anything with it. You could if you want to, of course. Um, you could serve a buffet of things, which I, I had recently with some friends that pulled something together that was fun. But 
Each one is just a meal in itself. So you could serve the soup just as a meal. It's really filling. It has enough protein in it to call it a meal. So that was my idea too, that each one is nutritionally complete, um, which a lot of the books that I looked at that were like one pot meals, um, that wasn't necessarily the case. Like you kind of maybe needed to make a protein with it or it was more like a one pot dish as opposed to a one pot meal. So anyway, ch can of chickpeas in there, it makes it really creamy. Um, and then tahini, I've been like a little bit obsessed with tahini. Do you, who eats tahini, has tahini in their cupboard? Um, most of you. Uh, I find it turns like a lot of things, roasted vegetables, everything, into like a meal in a way. So it's, um, for those of you who may not know, it's basically like peanut butter, but it's made with sesame seeds, so it's sesame paste. Um, and it's, you just stir it with a little bit of water and lemon juice. For this, I don't even put lemon juice because I didn't want the tang. Um, but it's, it's easy to use and it's delicious. Oh, and the crispy chickpeas, it's just those little snacks. I, they were like lurking in my cabinet one day. I was like, those would be good on soup. And that's how, and that's how I think of things. Um, this is a, uh, illustrates uh, just the fun I had with the notion of one pot because this is turkey meatballs um, and spaghetti and arugula and sauce. And it's all made in one pot like you don't need a colander. I'm not, you don't boil the pasta, then drain it, and then put it back in the pot. You literally boil the spaghetti, you, you, you brown the meatballs, turkey meatballs, and by the way, I use whole grain oats instead of breadcrumbs in them. Keeps it moist and makes them healthier. That's the usually business that I was talking about. Then I brown them in the pot, take them out of the pot, make the sauce, and add two cups of water to, the, and the simple sauce, just like garlic and a can of tomatoes and some herbs then uh, an olive oil. Then I add a cup, two cups of water to that. And then everyone around you thinks you're nuts for adding two cups of water to your sauce. Um, but then you put the pasta right in, regular pasta, uh, whole grain I prefer, but either one is fine actually. You put it right in the, uh, right in the pot and it cooks down perfect al dente. It absorbs the water, it softens, it kind of thickens the sauce a little bit. Um, and it's beautiful, and it's one of my favorite, most fun. And then you don't need to make a salad with it or anything because you just throw all this arugula in it. Um, or spinach, you know, any, whatever green you like. So that's kind of fun. Um, this is a skillet meal. That's a, um, a frittata. It's Swiss chard and potato with smoked paprika. So it's kind of like a Spanish tortilla, except the thing about a Spanish tortilla, they cook the, have you had the Spanish tortilla is basically like, looks just like this, but um, it's layers of potato cooked in like loads of oil, and then you have to flip it, and it's like scary. <laughs> um, so this you don't flip, it sort of like takes the flavors of the Spanish tortilla um, without the gobs and gobs of oil, just like enough. Uh, it cooks the potato, and then Swiss chard is, um, is one of my favorite vegetables. You could really use any green for this. You could use spinach or kale. Um, but I feel like Swiss chard is underrated, and it's a lot of times in CSA boxes. Um, so if you have that. But anyway, the other thing about this dish, it's made in one skillet, and it's that complete meal, um, is that it's really nice for a party. So there's lots of dishes that are, they're all meant to be meals on their own, but there are many that are like toasts and things that could easily be served at a party. And it's really nice to have one pot meals for a party, too. So speaking of parties, these are potato nachos. Um, I love these. This is, um, yeah, just all in one sheet pan. And then it's a meal because it has all the beans on it, uh, some cheddar cheese, some jack cheese. It's, I love those. But that's a fun one for a party, too. You could serve it right on the sheet pan or move it, whatever you like. This is a um, Brazilian seafood stew. So I feel like my food is kind of, um, so it's vegetable focused, it's plant focused, but it's I'm an omnivore. And, um, but the first, I, I did something different with this book that I have for the past books. In the traditional sort of layout for recipes is you kind of start with the meat, then poultry, then seafood, then vegetable, and sides and dessert. I actually flipped it and I started this with the uh, vegetable protein chapter. Um, and then the last chap, the, then I went to the seafood, poultry, then, um, then meat, and then uh, dessert. So there's a, there's a lot. So it just like kind of reframes the order of what we should maybe be eating more of. Um, 
And, uh, and anyway, I feel like overall, though, it's a more Mediterranean kind of approach to eating, um, but with world flavors. So back to my childhood in Queens, loving to go to all these, and even now, loving to go to all of these restaurants from all different cultures. Um, I think that's really reflected in the book, but in a way where it's easy to get the ingredients. So I'm not putting anything in there that you have to really order online. Um, everything you can get at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or a regular grocery store. Um, so this is a Greek chicken. And this, this kind of, I wanted to put this in here because I love this <laughs> chicken dish. But it kind of reflects also another sensibility. So you might ordinarily, and I might even, okay, chicken for dinner tonight. I'm going to put some chicken on a sheet pan and then I guess steam maybe broccoli or whatever. But this, but my job, I think, is to elevate it for you, and help give it a little bit of a, of, of a essence of excitement that you might not have the energy to think about on a weeknight. Um, so, so sometimes, so this is basically ro roasted chicken on a sheet pan, but it, it's so amazing, like it bursts with flavor and color. So I, there's potatoes on there, there's uh, bell peppers, and then after there's all these fun garnishes, so olives and feta cheese and herbs, um, and it just makes it exciting instead of, oopsie, didn't mean to do that. Um, and then so last is dessert, and then the gang from Barrett's book made this for you, so hopefully you'll, and the fun thing about this, I really tried to minimize the amount of dishes overall. I mean, there are definitely some recipes where you use a food processor or um, have a couple of couple of bowls, but mostly I tried to minimize the amount of mixing bowls too. Um, and in this particular case, you literally make the batter directly in the pan. Like you put the flour and, the, and it's actually a vegan, it's, you're, anyone try, ever try this or hear of the magic cake? It's like, it's basically a vegan cake. It's, it's called also a war cake because during uh, wartime when butter and eggs and milk were rationed, this was invented because it just uses oil, so oil instead of butter, so healthy oil. I, might, I think I use olive oil. You could use olive oil in this too. I forget which I use. Um, and it has no eggs or butter, so, or milk. <laughs> so it's kind of a magical recipe, and it's so moist. I mean, again, I'm not, I don't, I don't like framing food as what it doesn't have, um, but I just think that's kind of cool that it's a cake that doesn't have that, that happens to be incredibly moist and chocolatey and delicious, and you can make it in one pan without a bowl. <laughs> so that's what it does have. Um, so that's my story, my story and Hole in One's story. And I hope you'll follow me. I know some of you are that you mentioned, and I'm happy to take questions and chat about, whoa. <laughs> Is that too bright, a little? Can we split the difference of that light? <laughs> So it depends. So I do a lot of work prior to getting in the kitchen. Because once you shop for ingredients, and then I have an assistant helping me, so now I'm hiring, you know, helping me prep and clean and stuff. So it's um, a lot of resources go into just getting into the kitchen. So prior to even starting cooking, I usually um, really think it through on paper. So I'll say like, okay, I want to do a war cake. This is what, this is called a war cake. How should I do it? You know, what should I do? Should I do a chocolate one? Should I do a gingerbread one? You know, so then I really start to think about the flavor profile. So let's say then I settle on the chocolate. I want to do a chocolate war cake. Okay, so then I'll, I'll look in my own archives. What have I done? Have I done any war cakes before of different sizes? And I actually did one in a small pan. Now, I'm, now I start to literally on paper think how I'm going to scale that. And I do my best guesses of how I'm going to scale that to a sheet pan. And I'll even pour water in the sheet pan to see what the volume of the sheet pan is. I, I remember doing that. Um, before I even get into the kitchen and start making batter. So then it's, I essentially write the recipe out, how I think it's going to go. And I might have a lot of question marks on there. Um, and then by, that, by the time I get to the kitchen, it usually is where it's in good shape, um, where I may have to only make it a couple of times. Sometimes it doesn't work out. My whole, all my planning and all my thinking and all my research 
and it's terrible, and I don't know why, and oh. But usually it's salvageable, like, oh, you know what? This is just dry, and it needs this, or it overflowed the sheet pan, and I just need to cut down everything proportionately, but how am I going to only do three quarters of an egg, or whatever? Like, then I start to, then it becomes troubleshooting. And I have made things recently for my Washington Post column. I made uh, the zucchini pancake nine times. And I literally was like an insane person. And the more I do it, the more insane I get. Uh, I get like, oh, what if I put in one more cup of one more tablespoon of flour? What would happen then? <laughs> like, I start to like get crazy. But um, but usually I don't have to do test it more than twice because I do so much work, really hours of work beforehand. <laughs> Long answer to a short question. <laughs> I'll try not to torture you. Oh, how do I do the nutrition analysis? So when I'm cooking, and this is something very unique actually about the way I cook too, because I measure everything and weigh everything. So I have um, cup measures as well as weight measures because I have a nutrition analysis program. So after I have the recipe set, and I, this is the recipe, then I do the nutrition analysis. So you basically plug in the numbers into this. It's a, prof you know, they have these things online, but this is a professional program that like. Um, is based on the USDA data, but I enter the ingredients as raw ingredients. So it's not a perfect, no nutrition data is ever going to be perfect, which is why it should only be a guide. Um, but I do, you know, I do measure, I do weigh everything. I weigh the edible portion. So like, let's say I buy a pound of carrots, I'll weigh the amount of carrots that I use in the recipe after they're trimmed. So there's a lot of annoying, if I get to cook without measuring, it's like dancing naked on the beach. It's like, I'm cooking without measuring. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> anyway, I, it, it, it's tedious sometimes to measure, but that's how you get. I, I'm trying to make sure everything. Sometimes I'll use a jar of pepper, of like roasted peppers, then those would be, then you enter that as roasted peppers, but drained, and you have to measure it drained. I mean, it's like a pain in the neck. <laughs> uh, no, a lot of work, but but it says it's act. Yeah, everything's raw, so ultimately the carrots will get cooked. So maybe some of the nutrients would change the theor not theoretically, but actually, when they're cooked. But that's most nutrition data for recipes is done with the raw ingredients. Oh, so oh, thanks for that. Actually, it's uh, just as an aside. I shot my Ellie's Real Good Food, the public television show, just in Norwalk, right down the street. So. <laughs> yeah, at the Clark Kitchens. So, um, so I'm your neighbor, basically. <laughs> um, so, okay, so it's a little um, sort of side story, you know. In, in movies, they have like the main story and then the side story. <laughs> the side story is, um, so I was always interested in like acting and improvisational acting. That was my hobby in high school. And, um, and so I did, when I, after my freshman year of college, I started doing uh, TV commercials and modeling to pay for college. And that, I never really wanted to do that as a job, but I just, as a long-term career but I needed a job and it wound up working out and being this like 15 year career of modeling and doing TV commercials while I was going to school and while I was, it actually supported my, um, my private practice and my nutrition career for many years until I quit after I got my first TV show. But I always wanted to really combine these loves of being on camera and communicating that way and also writing um, with my nutrition knowledge. So I did my master's in nutrition education with a minor in journalism. And then I did internships at CNN, internships at CBS. Like I really wanted to do exactly this. And then in terms of the cooking piece of it, I just always cooked for as long as I could remember. And then I did, um, like I was one of those people who will like buy, when I was in college, would like spend a Saturday making sauce with like all these overripe tomatoes that I bought at the farmer's market. So, while my friends were drinking beer, doing beer pong or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> you could call me boring, but, um, but uh, I didn't think so. And then you have lots of friends when you're making sauce. So, um, so yeah, so I always love the cooking piece of it. And then I purposefully really wanted to do this in the media. And I, carve that out. And when I graduated from my master's, I just started like pitching, pitching people, pitching producers. And it took me years before anyone said yes. But I, I called it planting seeds. And I would just like every day pitch something, an article idea, 
um, or a segment idea, and uh, and then one or two little seeds grew, and then it worked. <laughs> but uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. I think I really believe that if you do what you passionately want to do, and you're willing to work very, very hard, that you will get there. <laughs> so whatever that is for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could really, I like cast iron a lot, but sometimes you need a non more of a nonstick surface. So it depends on the recipe. Like for the egg dish, I, I recommend a nonstick surface. Um, cast iron is really nice for the cookies and, and, other, and they look beautiful. They're beautiful for serving. But actually, the cast iron didn't work nicely for this crisp that I did because it it um, it um, oxidizes. If it's a strawberry crisp, it oxidizes and then it gets like purple around. It's interesting. I learned these things the hard way. That was an example. I did all my research and then I have a purple crisp <laughs> that is strawberry. I mean, it's okay if it's blueberry. I may have actually changed it to blueberry for that very reason, to be totally honest with you. But those are the kinds of things. But um, but yeah, so, and I actually have um, Circulon um, actually did a hole-in-one inspired kit. So, um, so that's like a pot, cheap pan, skillet, and uh, kit that they did for me. But so it could really be anything, though, to be honest. Like, whatever you have, you don't really need something special. Although cast iron's wonderful. So this is a really hard question because I, I, I recognize very, I work with a lot of, like, hunger organizations. I work with a lot of people who struggle to put food on the table, and, I, and they cannot afford organic food. And I don't think they should feel bad about it. <laughs> so I feel like it's very hard to message this to the public, in a way, um, without um, making people somehow feel bad or guilty. Um, so I think uh, my basic stand is, is that organic food isn't, necessarily better for you, but I think there's some, it's more of an um, agricultural system that I'm in favor of, looking toward that agricultural system. I like to buy organic food, but honestly, like I go to my local farmer's market, and they don't grow their apples organically. They don't, he doesn't grow completely organically because he can't afford the organic certification because he's a small farmer, but I know how that guy grows his food with the utmost respect to the land and to the food and the people and his family lives on the farm. So I think there's other factors to consider. I wouldn't get wrapped up. If I saw in a, in a market local apples or organic apples, I would pick the local. So first of all, I pick local. Then I try to pick organic, but I won't get worked up about it. That's my stand. And I won't get worked up about it because frankly, not eating a fruit or vegetable, like the, uh, the environmental working group's dirty dozen, really bothers me because I know people who won't eat a blueberry if it's not organic because of that and that's a mistake. It's honestly a health mistake and they even say that in the fine print. But I think it's very fear mongering and so people are like afraid and, and I don't want I think people shouldn't be afraid of their food. Um, we have issues with our, with our agricultural system overall that need fixing. Um, but just from a consumer perspective, but that's like sort of a different conversation in a way. Just from a consumer perspective, I think people shouldn't be afraid of their food. Um, choosing organic is wonderful. Choosing local food as much as possible, supporting your local community is important. And I, I give that even um, priority over organic. Does that, does that help? <laughs> okay. It's a hard question. I mean, I, I, it's, those kinds of things keep me up at night, <laughs> Not honestly. But not the fear of the food. Like even GMO corn, like that doesn't keep me up at night. I'm not afraid of eating that. Um, I'm more of afraid for the whole system that is not very well regulated. Spices, you mean? Oh, I can't pick one. <laughs> you need like, that's your palate, right? So I think definitely like cumin, coriander, oregano, turmeric, that world. But you can get little ones. Get little ones. It doesn't have to be a big investment. You don't even want big ones because they are going to lose their potency fast. So for a dollar twenty-nine, just like get a bunch of spices. <laughs> but I, I stay away from mixes, and because then you can make your own little mixes. Like if I add chili powder, I always have chili powder. 
then you can go into like kinds of chili powder, but at the very, you know, like ancho, chipotle, but at the very least I have just regular chili powder at home. It's a so nice basis for a rub or for chili. <laughs> um, uh, so what else? Smoked paprika, I love. Oh my goodness, so regular paprika, a sweet paprika, like Hungarian paprika, and smoked paprika. And now, like McCormick sells smoked paprika. You don't have to even do, go to a special store for it, but it's magical. It just is, sm it's literally smoked. They take the pepper and smoke it and then grind it, and it has this incredible smoky aroma. And it's very commonly used in Spanish food. And it, you put it on eggs, you put it on potatoes. It's like very transformative. So I love that stuff. I don't know. Is it, I just have a question. You just don't like the flavor of garlic or it, it disagrees with you? Right, you're, more, you're sensitive to it. And that's the beauty of recipes in general is that you can modify them to how, there's just a guide. This is how I like it. And then you can make it however you, and I'm actually very sensitive to garlic also. Um, I don't like raw garlic at all. Like it just kills me. But I'll put it in a little bit and I know that it changes the thing in sometimes a really good way, but then I can't tolerate it. So I, I understand that completely. Um, you could just leave it out. You could maybe use a, sh sometimes shallots I think have a little bit more of an intense flavor. Um, but in this case, you just need some kind of aromatic. So aromatics being <laughs> leeks, shallots, onions, garlic, those are ginger. Actually, Ginger would be nice in there, actually. I think, do I have ginger in it? Um, so you can kind of like, oh, that would be nice with ginger. You can pick another aromatic, or you could literally, as long as it has one, you could just <coughs> use onion. That would be, and it would still be very tasty. So, yeah. And maybe you just want to do like one clove of garlic, just so it doesn't taste like garlic, but like has like, just gives it another layer. But if you don't, it's still going to be good. It has enough going on in there. It's not relying on the garlic. Um, as it's as the um, aromatic gluten sensitivity. Um, my take is, is that you should respect yourself if you have oh, that. Yeah, then um, and actually in the book I give uh, alternates for where I think a gluten free thing will work, a gluten free um, ingredient will work to make the recipe gluten free. Um, I I do think that a lot of people are gluten free and it's code for I'm on a diet. Um, and I actually think that that trivializes the people that have like the real issue with gluten. And now, just so you know, there are, um, my, I have family who's celiac, and that means you can't have any gluten at all. Even, it can't even like touch a board that had a gluten containing thing on, or he will, my family will be sick. Um, then there is a bona fide recognized condition called gluten sensitivity where you have a threshold for Gluten. And when I was in college learning about this, that, that wasn't even a thing that existed. We didn't think that, we didn't understand that at all. And this has been fairly recent um, discovery that people have sometimes a threshold for how much gluten they can handle. So you, you cannot make fun of people who eat a piece of bread one day and then say they can't eat it the next day. Um, it's a very often, you know, legitimate. So I think my take is, is that people should respect other people's um, needs. <laughs> but try not, you know, if it's a, it's not a good diet to be on. And, and I think that's the issue because actually breads and products that are gluten free often have, instead of whole grain, wheat, they'll have um, starches that fill in for the gluten. They're actually less healthy and more fattening, you know, more concentrated in calories. So it's not, a, it's nothing to, to do as like a weight loss technique. That's what really bothers me when it seems like the celebrity trend type of thing. I don't know. Okay. You know, it costs a lot of money to produce that show, yes. and I have to basically come up with it. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, and I just started becoming like a, um, it's, it's gonna continue, it's in reruns. Yes. Um, but each season I had to come up with like almost a half a million dollars and go to like sponsors, and I, my whole life started becoming this person who's like trying to get sponsors, and that's not really my, what I wonder, and I'm actually, it's interesting because I'm finding I'm getting as much of an audience in some ways as, because I've been doing Facebook Live and uh, Instagram videos and really doing that, and it's so, it costs like, I just, I just do it in my test kitchen, it's really casual, and, um, and 
I probably get, um, you know, it's not the same type of quality as having a television show, but I'm finding it, it's reaching, it's hitting the same notes for people and in a much less labor, uh, much uh, sort of less expensive way where I'm having to spend my entire life getting sponsors for a show. Just not really. Oh, yeah, I'm on YouTube too. Yeah, I put them on all these things. Yeah, I do them like once a week. So fun videos. So it's good. I, I'm really enjoying it. And then I do lives too. So people can like, I, I really enjoy the interaction on social media. Yeah, we're not even live. It's not live on YouTube. Okay. It's just the tape, the videos. Okay. So. I wish I should really know my YouTube channel name. <laughs> <laughs> I know everything that we post on here gets posted on there sort of automatically. So, oh my lord, I wish I had a picture to show you um, of this situation. It's insane. So I, the photographer is Randy Baird, and she, um, funny enough, but she and I went to junior high school together, um, and so but we took a week in my test kitchen. We shot it. That's my test kitchen. Um, it's basically an apartment, just like residential apartment. Um, and we shot, yeah, it takes, we did, it's a really heavy schedule to do them in a week, but we did like 10 recipes a day. Um, no, we, there's a food stylist, there's a prop stylist, there's a photographer, there's a photographer's assistant. Oh my gosh, the props, like the prop stylist rents all this stuff from this, and there's like pl all different kinds of plates and silverware, like a whole filling up the, the surface of that piano with like silverware, different kinds. Um, and then plates and linens and all this stuff. She just like brings it all in. It's an amazing, amazing, it's a whole job in itself. And then I just sort of like coordinated everything and made sure everything looked the way it was supposed to look. But yeah, yeah, it was a, a whole, Big deal. <laughs>